Okay, let's try this again. Well, hi there. <clears throat> My name is uh, Charles Ray Dawson. I'm the Associate Broker Residential Sales Manager at ProStar Realty. This is the Unnamed Real Estate Podcast, episode 141, which is going to be a take two of episode 140. And I hope you guys are all doing pretty good today. The um, What's really great about prepping for this particular episode is that I'm just pretty much going to do last episode again. See if we can't get it all out because th those... <laughs> Those guys out there who remember last week, all right, I was having a bunch of technical difficulties and had uh, a couple of things I wanted to do cover, all right, didn't get to because of technical if difficulties. Actually, I did get to cover them, but then you couldn't hear what I said. Hopefully, you're hearing it now, a little green light's on, okay, um, see that I have the system sound turned off, which is important, so hopefully this will work out. Um, not a lot of real estate news this week which makes it really good to recap what i wanted to talk about last week right the um highlights of last week was two things one um the interest rates are still on their way up um inflation numbers came in today supporting what we were talking about last week is that hey you know if you take out energy electricity and gas food shelter all right and a couple other things, inflation's pretty good, right? So as long as you don't need to drive or live in air conditioning or eat or not get rained on, life's going pretty good for you. So those basic consumer things, you can go buy more clothes, maybe another big screen TV, those prices have all come down, right? But remember, as long as those that inflation stays that high, all right. That means the 10-year bond market is going to stay that high, which means our interest rates are going to stay that high. Now, last week when we were discussing this, or I was discussing this with a um, one of my lender agents, my agents who are a lender, you guys all know who I'm talking about, um, I dropped the word the market is frozen. I'm like, hey, it's just it's frozen up. It's froze up. All right. This is where we're at right now. All right. There's still some sublimination of ice to, you know, to atmospheric water, but there's no rain. It's we're frozen up. And damn it, the next day, all right, after I released my what should have been a great, you know, podcast and everything like that. I had three other people here in the area and nationally all using the same word. We're frozen. All right. So let me, let me, okay, guys, numbers, I right, explain you better with the numbers, right? Because this sort of shows what we're at right now. And we're going to go a little bit deeper detail than normal. Okay, these are the numbers for October 12, 2023. Active this week are 13,740. That's up 114 from the week before. New listings are 1,923, which is actually down 70. Contracts were 1,719, down 114. And closings were 683. Coming soon to an MLS near you is 665 new listings. Crawford report numbers show the picture better. Supply has jumped up to 54.0, okay? Um, demand has dropped to 74.0, which puts us at 137.0. So we're still looking at a seller's market. But remember, our supply should be at 100. We're at 54. Our demand should be at 100. We're at 74. 74 buyers looking at 54 houses. All right. Still makes it a seller's market, but not in all areas anymore. All right. So let me change this out real quick because I recognize that as being an old one. I was so excited to talk to you guys. I did not even bother. Hold on for just a second. Okay. A little correction on the fly right there. Boom. Here's this week's numbers. That little glimpse you got was last week's numbers, right? Notice in every one of our areas now, we're all trending down. That's what the little red dots mean, right? And we're looking at Maricopa and Goodyear at 90.4 and 90.5. They are just on the line be before going into what would be considered a buyer's market. Remember, 90 is where the buyer's market stops or starts. They're just right there, right? But Maricopa, Goodyear, Queen Creek, Buckeye, all right, those four are our balanced markets right there, all right? And this trend line is going to go up. I mean, we can easily see Queen Creek, Goodyear, and Maricopa. And in fact, I'll guarantee you this time next week, Maricopa is going to be in, in a buyer's market. 
All right. So if you were looking for the deals, that's where you're going out to. All right. Chandler is still leading the pack, but they've dropped down to 2,001.7. They're down 25 month over month right now. 25% month over month. All right. Fountain Hills, Glendale, Phoenix are the top, uh, top four properties. But Tempe slid that south. Remember, it was Tempe and Cave Creek. Those were our trending upwards. And now Cave Creek is negative nine. All right. Tempe is negative four. That means, because remember, this is month over month, which means we just dropped a week. It would be the week of five weeks ago. All right. We've dropped that and added last week. Okay. So that's how quickly the, those two areas have moved. All right. Because to go from a positive, which means at least a plus one, Okay, for Tempe to a negative four, that means that in that one week they would have to drop enough to bring the whole thing down 5%. All right? And glacialization, where's the global warming when we need it? All right? So, and I wanted to show you some trend lines I'm seeing on my Excel spreadsheet that I track all these numbers in. All right? Let's take a look at this, all right? You can see here on the active side of the house, all right, this... Active listings have been going up since August, August the 9th, right? But you can really see it kick off, all right, right here, moving from August 23rd in uh, um, August, starting to jump up in multiples, and it's speeding up. In fact, if it wasn't for August 30th to September 6th, where it actually went down a whole screaming four houses, all right, you would see it <clears throat> increase every week, the delta, the rate of change, right? I mean, we see our new listings and stuff like that. It's bouncing back and forth, okay? So we're not seeing a sudden jump up in listings here. But what we are seeing over here is the pendings, all right? Pending, under contract, looking for backups, and contracts with buyer contingencies, all right? You get a lot of static, a lot of noise in these numbers and stuff like that. But what you can sit there over time is realize there is a trend here of under contracts looking for backups and pending where that trend line is actually moving towards for less people going under contract. And you definitely see that over here on this side with all this red. All right. So we're freezing up. We're getting more inventory on the market that is just changing the ratios over, pushing it over from our push pushing it over from that seller's market into a balanced market and what's driving the whole thing it's those interest rates all right we're looking at 20 year, year highs right now which means this buying generation this first time home buyer generation which are your millennials that kicked off two years ago when they hit the, the bulk of them hit the market all right they're they're scrambling right now all right just uh remind you what those numbers are and what that looks like i still got this and i've saved this because i get a lot of mileage out of this all right Start our home at 400, putting 20% down, all right, which would be a 5% FHA, all right. This is what you're looking at for your mortgage payment at a seven and a quarter interest rate, all right. At this market right now, you're happy to get seven and a quarter, all right. That means you've been able to get that down, all right. Um, still not sure about whether or not we're going to see eights, okay. I was pretty sure we're going to see eights. Now I'm getting a little bit more, all right, maybe that's not going to happen because there are some action going on in the bond market, but I would not be surprised. All right, let's keep an eye on these things. Just remember, when you look back at that 3.5% interest rate, look at the difference in what you would have been paying. You would be paying $900 a month less all right, for the same house at $400,000 with a 3.5% interest rate. Once again, when these rates come down, it's not a matter of this. Sooner or later, they will come down. You're going to see all hell break loose. All right. Everybody who can make this payment, who can suddenly make this payment, are going to come out of the woodwork. All right. Remember, not a lot. Inventory is coming up, but we're still below normals. All right. And why are we below normals? Because people keep moving to Arizona. We can't stop this. Unless that article that I, I discussed last week, all right, and discussed a little bit on the part I actually got out. All right. This was sent to me by one of our viewers. All right. There's a California couple, halts moved to Arizona over water woes. They walked away from $30,000 that they put down on a, on a house. All right. And they put that money down on a house, a new build and stuff like that. And then they decided to walk away because they did not trust the water. Um, now, when you build in Arizona, when you build a subdivision in Arizona, you have to file a water report that says, that guarantees you've done the studies and there will be over 100 years worth of water going into that house. 
right? These buyers didn't believe the report. And now certain min municipalities and they will, they require that these subdivisions redo that every 15 years, right? Might actually be pretty, you know, make a lot of sense, right? But you sit there and say, Hey, we're going to be pulling in, you know, this is where we're going to get water from. We're going to be pulling it out from that reservoir. That reservoir has so many acre feet of water. Right? And because they have so many and it's not all allocated, we're going to take our share, our allotment out of that reservoir. Right? And the Department of Interior says that that reservoir is always going to be within those two levels for the end of time. Now, all you guys have been looking at Lake Powell, all right, Lake Mead, anything on the Colorado River knows that those reservoirs have been drawn down significantly over the last uh, couple of years. Although this year was very good. I find it really interesting that when the reservoirs go down, you get news articles about how low the reservoirs are. Right? I did not see a lot of articles about how much water we put in because we had a really wet winter. All right. So that's, but Department of the Interior, and if I'm wrong on that, my dad will correct me. Um, hi, Dad. Um, the Department of the Interior says, hey, Lake Roosevelt, this much water allocated over this many years. We don't have it all allocated out yet. Here goes, you know, and so a builder can come in, file a report saying we're going to be drawing out of this reservoir. This reservoir is certified to have this much water. We're going to be taking allotment. We're good to go. All right. So California couple decided they didn't want to move to Arizona because they were concerned. Ultimately, they're saying they didn't trust the Department of Interior. All right. Do you trust the Department of Interior? Do you trust your government? This is not that kind of podcast. <laughs> Yeah, YouTube, just like put a little check mark next to me, political, you know. Um, so, and I just moved up a line on my FBI watch list score. So, anyways, this, you know, the other supporting article in this, all right, um, that came out, news came out the day I was recording. Actually, I'd seen it earlier, but I hadn't had a chance to actually look up the actual report on that, was our governor. All right. And this would be Katie Hobbs, all right? She did something where she told the Saudis, I don't know if you can read that when I go like that cuz I'm covering my face up, all right? But she told the Saudis, all right, that the Saudis can't um she revoked their lease of uh farmland here in Arizona. Now, for you guys outside of Arizona, we do have farms here, all right? They are all irrigated land. We don't do dry wheat farming cuz it's way too dr dry for dry wheat farming. Um, but a lot of Arizona was, you know, settled on cotton and cattle and citrus, all right, and, and copper, the four seas. I think there's a fifth, all right, um, climate, climate was the fifth. So it was cotton, cattle, citrus, climate, co you know, copper, or however that combination goes. So... When, when you have that water allocated out of the reservoir, Lake Pleasant or Lake Roosevelt, all right, and that water is allocated to this acre out there in the desert, they do their ditches, ditches a canal act, look it up, all right, and they create a that into farmland. They bring the water from the reservoirs to the farmland, right? And when you are a farmer and you are irrigating your crops, you use, you use this term called acre feet, all right? An acre foot is one foot of water, the amount of water it takes to flood an acre one foot deep. Does that make sense? All right. Yeah, that's about 12 inches. All right. So, and an acre, for you guys who didn't go to real estate school, can rattle off 43,560 square feet off the top of your head, which is the only time we get to use this when we're talking about it. All right. Is, so that would be 43,560 cubic feet of water. And I could pull out my calculator and start dividing my threes and figure out how many cubic yards that is and this and that and the other thing. Anyways, so you have this cubic, you know, these cubic feet of water going into the farmland. Now, the reason why Katie Hobbs decided to tell the Saudis they couldn't grow alfalfa anymore is because the Saudis were leasing the land, planting alfalfa, harvesting alfalfa, shipping it out to L.A., and then shipping it to uh, Saudi Arabia to feed cattle. 
Only in a global market does this make any kind of economic sense, all right? And for you people out there who like to listen to Peter Zahan, you understand that the only reason why this works is because of the United States Navy, all right? And the fact that we do have a global market because you can't actually ship stuff from point A to point B without worrying about pirates hitting it. Or somebody who does not like your country deciding to cut off your strategic alfalfa reserves. But when, with that in mind, Katie Hobbs and Pete, and I agree with her on this, visualizes that, all right, is that you're literally taking Arizona water and shipping it to Saudi Arabia, right? You're packaging that water, right? You're transforming that water into a, another good alfalfa, all right? And then you're shipping it over there to get the benefits of being able to feed cattle in Saudi Arabia. Now, there's no reason why you couldn't have that water go in alfalfa and then be fed to cattle here. And then we slaughter and feed, you know, freeze the cattle and ship cattle, you know, beef off to Saudi Arabia. Right. That's a, that would put us higher, you know, more value added on the supply chain. Right. But ultimately at the end of the day, our natural resources being shipped over to Saudi Arabia. And you said, nah, dog, we're not going to do that. So, what makes this interesting for me and how these two articles tie together is people do not understand how water intensive it is to grow crops, even growing crops in better environments than Arizona. The reason why we get to have an agricultural state here is because of the reservoirs and the entire irrigation system that has literally been here for a thousand years, right? Our canals are built on the same waterways that the Ohohokam tribes built their canals on. Right, we didn't come in here with this whole concept of, hey, you know, we're going to introduce you guys to something called irrigation. Ooh, wow, irrigation. That's amazing. It's an amazing great way, Father. We never would have thought about that. No, they thought about it too, and they're quite happily doing it. Um, if you go to school in Utah, and while you are going to school in Utah and you take that in eighth grade, I think it was the history of Utah in that history of Utah textbook, they will explain to you how Brigham Young invented irrigation and brought it to the world. Okay. I really hate to tell you guys that, but that's not how that worked. Right. But remember, this was a public school. This was a public school book. All right. This was. You know, the Utah equivalent of Howard Zinn's The People's, you know, Story of America or whatever like that. It's just, it was made up bullshit, right? right? Irrigation has been around for quite some time, right? Might have been the first time they, you know, anybody did it in Utah. And I bet you if you talk to your Uter Paiute tribe, they would say otherwise. But hey, right? irrigation is a very, very big thing here. We've been growing, you know, crops here in Arizona since the dawn of time. All right. Not necessarily these crops and maybe not necessarily crops that are this water intensive. And alfalfa, alfalfa is a pretty water intensive uh, crop. Where am I going with this? Let's bring it back to housing. A household uses a half acre foot on average of water. That's for everything. That's for your yard. That's for your dishwasher. That's for going and making your coffee in the morning. That's for showering your nasty body in the morning when you have to go to work. All water use. You can estimate it out. About a half an acre foot. Which means one acre foot can do two households. Now watch this. I have an acre of land that's planted in alfalfa. All right. Alfalfa. These are numbers that I looked up so I can give this little speech to you. Alfalfa requires six inches of water, that much water, acre foot, for one ton of alfalfa. We measure alfalfa in tons. All right. Don't ask me what the cubic foot of a ton of alfalfa is. Right? It's pretty water dense and stuff like that. So I could say maybe about the size of a cord of wood. And about two people watching this thing actually could visualize a, a cord of wood. So guys, Google. Even better, get off the computer. Go out there and chop yourself a cord of wood, all right? I really want to see somebody to try that. Just like show up randomly some farm. I'm taking the Ray Dawson challenge. I need to chop, you know, chop and split a cord of wood. Okay, Skippy. Here, you, okay, you know, Justin Trudeau, knock yourself out. Here's here's an axe right over there. I'll let you know when you've done a cord. Um, 
So getting back to alfalfa though, you know, alfalfa is measured in tons. It takes six inches of a six acre, you know, six inches of water, acre feet of water. So a half acre foot of water to grow a ton of, you know, alfalfa. How many tons of alfalfa do you get per acre? All right. The numbers I see is anywhere between eight and 14 tons. Now, certain climates have better responses, right? Um, and certain climates have natural rainfall. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you're going to need six inches of water per ton. All right. And an acre can do anywhere between eight and 14 tons of alfalfa. Let's say Arizona sucks. Right, let's say you're, only, you're at the bottom end of the scale and you're only getting eight tons per acre, right? That is 48 inches of water. That is four acre feet, right, to do alfalfa in. That's what Katie Hobbs' problem with the Saudis are. You're pulling out four acre feet of water, right, per acre, and shipping it off to Saudi Arabia, Arabia to feed cattle. Now, the question you need to ask is how many households can live on an acre? All right, let's say you have an acre. Everybody's heard about the dream quarter acre lot, all right? Anybody who has the dream of a quarter acre lot has never mowed a quarter acre lot, all right? But here in Arizona, we tend to dense pack our houses together and stuff like that. All right. But let's say you're in a luxury subdivision, right, where you're going to take five acres and or take an acre and allocate it out so four families can be on there. All right. Just four families. All right. What do you do with that extra acre? Well, that becomes your roads. And that becomes your public spaces, you know, that becomes your flood control green zones and everything like that. That, you know, becomes your setbacks of the subdivision itself, all right? Notice there's always this little patch of land between the road and the sidewalk, right? And there's this patch of land before you get to the walled complex that is a subdivision nowadays. But let's just go one. Let's just say you're only putting four households on there, all right? If I put four households on an acre that used to be an alfalfa, all right, that was taking four acre feet of water. All right, for four house households, I only need two acre feet. I just saved two acre feet of water, right? Because I'm not spending it growing at alfalfa. And I, I've found before in the past that that's a hard complex uh, complex concept for people to understand. All right, but if you are spending something. And all of a sudden, you're no longer spending something because your cost has gone away. It's a net benefit to you. All right? If you know, let me let me put it like this: If you're driving a car that you have to take down to the shop and pay five hundred dollars on average a month, that means you might have a month where you're not paying five hundred dollars directly to your mechanic. All right? You're saving it up for for a couple months before you have to drop fifteen hundred, but it averages out to five hundred dollars a month. All right. And let's say because your costs are everything, you know, gas, oil, whatever. And then you go and you get rid of that car and you get a new car with a car payment of three hundred dollars a month. You've effectively saved two hundred dollars a month getting the new car. All right. That mechanism works with water. When we take those glorious alfalfa fields and we convert them over into housing, we actually save water as a whole. I got a really fun conversation with one of my uncle's friends who was an attorney from back east. Could not grasp that freaking concept. All right. All he could think of was developing housing bad. It's like, no, the water's already allocated. The water's already there. Now, notice I have not said whether or not we're going to have less water in 100 years because of global warming or anything like that. I'm just saying well, this is what we got going on right now. You want to save water, get rid of the farms and put houses there. All right. That's my editorial for the day. So, so for that California couple, all right, I know a lot of Arizonans who think that's a good thing. Hey, California, follow their lead, lead. quit coming out here and buying up all of our houses because we don't have enough for our kids who were raised here out there trying to buy houses of their own right now. But, and hey, 
if it was, but at this point, if it wasn't for Californians coming out and freaking buying houses right now, uh, we'd have even less of a market than we do now, right? People, you know, it's the big cash buyers right now who are really make, keeping us afloat, right? Now, strangely enough, this is not those institutional buyers from two years ago. You know, the ones who are just coming in like buying subdivisions and whatnot, all right? Because, you know, they're not sure if they want to put mon money into that particular side of the market. Although we do have a lot of subdivisions going build to rent. They build the entire subdivision to rent out. So they recognize the need, the requirement for housing. And they're, you know, bullish on housing requirements. They're just not quite so bullish when it comes to, oh, let's just buy, in, you know, come in here and buy individual houses for rent. But they feel good enough about that to come in there and buy large tranches. It's, that's an interesting question. All right. It, uh, what does um, the big Wall Street uh, real estate companies know that the smaller investors are picking up threes or four houses for their portfolio don't know? All right. So... That covered pretty much it. Um, thanks for listening. The The water issue is never going to go away. It's, um, you know, and whether or not we get better or worse, okay, it's never going to go away. So these new subdivisions are pro I would probably say that a new subdivision uses less water than my current subdivision that I'm in right now because we all have grass and we all have trees and whatnot and chickens. My wife's got chickens, so we're, the chickens are well into development. The chickens take a certain amount of water too, if you ever want to go that route. But, um, you know, this is, this is going to be a recurring thing. So Katie Hobbs looking at that going, okay, water is a finite resource. And just remember the water needs to get used, right? There is evaporation out of the reservoirs and out of the canals and everything like that, all right? But it's that replenishment. It's literally the bathtub that we keep talking about, okay? Water comes in, water goes out, all right? Water falls in the mountains, snowpack melts, shows up in the reservoirs. We use it later on. I don't know if anybody has ever calculated what would happen if you closed up Lake Mead um, and stopped putting water into it and start stop taking water out how long would it take to evaporate i'm sure it's out there somewhere probably be like in six to eight inches a year who knows All right. but um that's that's the story of water that's the story about californians deciding they don't want to come in here um on the nar side of the house um let's see i think it was remax dropped out of nar last week and uh, joining anywhere, and this is really interesting because they're literally pulling out of the market. Boy, I did not even try to segue there. I hope I didn't blow anybody's, you know, mental clutches with that paradigm shift right there. But NAR's pulling, you know, uh, NAR's really, really suffering with these large brokerages who are saying, hey, we're not going to play with you anymore, right? Or if our agents want to, that's okay, All right? Uh, but Remax, Anywhere part of their settlement they both come out and say hey we're just not playing nars game all right we're leaving the board um redfin redfin pulled out a nar okay and that's big the question is can you pull out a nar and still get the support that you need from the state boards all right here in arizona the state board is pretty much an it's i'll say it all right if anybody from the Arizona Association of Realtors, you know, has a problem with what I'm going about to say, give me a call and I'll put you on. You can say your part. But AAR has pretty much got a monopoly right now when it comes to real estate in Arizona. Right? And it's not so much just access to the MLS because they will swear up and down. Anybody can have access to the MLS, right? even if they're not a, a licensed real estate agent. Good luck figuring out how. All right. Seriously. If you call, and I have called, and you ask, hey, how do I get access to the MLS? They will say, oh, go through your local board. And I'm like, I'm not on a local board. I'm not a, you know, I'm a little ice. And, I'm, you know, how do I get access to it? And they said, well, you got to go through your authorizing board. Like, like who? Oh, your home inspectors, your appraisers, that kind of stuff. But they'll tell you all day long, oh, you don't have to be a real estate agent to get access to the MLS. 
right? You just have to be an appraiser or a home inspector or something. It's, it's that kind of game. I'm pretty sure they have documented reasons of how, or document way to get access to the MLS without being a licensed realtor or licensed sales agent and member of the Arizona Association of Realtors. And it's probably a form that's in a filing cabinet in an unused bathroom in the basement all right, of their building all right, with a sign on the door that says, Beware the Leopard. And the stairs are out and the light bulb's out. But, you know, they have access out there. Okay. Points to anybody who got the um, Douglas Adams reference on that. So can Redfin pull out of the ML local MLS and replace that with their own in-house MLS because they have enough listings as a bulk to service their buyer clients right? and they have enough buyers coming in to service their selling clients. If they got that, they got critical mass. There was literally a brokerage in um, Minnesota or Michigan who was suing just for that. No, we don't have to be on the MLS. We own our neck of the woods we are the brokerage in this neck of the woods and so we don't have to do all these kind of play all these joining games so is is that the direction redfin things are going right the second hurdle to come across that here in arizona is all the freaking documents were put were built by aar arizona association of realtors is copyright them and is supposed to be only be able to be used by them and which doesn't seem like a big problem. I mean, it's a very big convenience for real estate agents to be using these preloaded, pre-ready-to-go documents that have been created by attorneys and worked with. But if you're an independent, you can't use that contract. So if I have a buyer and I happen to get over the MLS hurdle and I send an offer, want to send an offer over to the seller, I can't use the AAR form. I'm going to have to go down to like, you know, Staples or something and buy a real estate purchase contract that got them there, right? Fill that out, explain it to my client, make the offer that my client wants to offer. And then I send it over to the listing agent on the other side who's going to open that up and have no idea what they're looking at, right? Because they have not trained real estate agents in the state of Arizona how to read a contract. Arizona agents have been taught how to read the AAR contract. And if you go to your three hours of continuing education every two years, right, this is contract law, they're going to discuss that contract. Right? So your average, you know, James Muccatelli running around out there being a real estate agent, if you dropped one of these contracts in front of them, they would have no idea what to look at. Now, I have a collection of them. I just heard that. I actually keep a collection of non AAR contracts that I've seen over my time. These are not offers that have been sent to me directly, all right? But these are contracts that have been sent to Joe Blow consumers out there, Fizbos, whatever, or random you know, wholesaler investor dirt bags, you know, are trying to shake down grandma and stuff like that. And you sit there. And you read through this contract. Now, here's a fun thing, all right? And this is where a lot of real estate agents get up and get in trouble. All right. <clears throat> real estate agents are not attorneys. Alright. I personally think the line is vague. Alright. Gray. Unclearly defined in exactly how far a sales agent or licensed broker in the state of Arizona can go advising a con you know a client on what a contract means even if it's a real estate contract okay. I will sit there and read these things and I go okay this is what it says to me your mileage may vary and I always say the hey this is not an AAR contract. I haven't received freaking you know three hours, you know, of classes on how to read this particular contract. This is one we actually want to bounce by an attorney. 
right? Like this one right here, you read some of these things and they're all weighted towards the seller side or I mean towards the buyer side, all right? Up to including, oh yeah, here's your earnest money deposit. Oh, by the way, we get to pull out anytime we want and we'll get the earnest deposit back for any reason whatsoever. Yeah, you can put a number on there. You can say earnest money deposit and then three lines down going, we get this back for any reason we want. So I don't know if that's a good thing for you to choose if you're selling a house because I am not an attorney. I, I don't even play one on TV. So this is this is the fun part. This is, you know, this is I'm watching these guys really, really intensely. All right. Um, because this is what kills NAR. This is this is what kills NAR is is the time for NAR to die. I will tell you what. NAR is not, as we know it, is not going to exist within a year. It will have the name. It will have the logo. It will basically be an asset sale at this point. All right. We're buying your logo. We're buying your Rolodex. We're taking over your lease payments and everything like that. But at the end of the day, we're a completely different company because I think NAR is going to be something completely different in a year. All right. Where that comes from, where that's going to be, it's going to be really, really interesting. I'm hoping, and my inner chaos troll is hoping, all right, that from this destruction, we will see something better come out on the other side. All right. Well, let's see what happens. All right. So on that happy mind, shivering out here in the cold, all right, and I hope you're not shivering out here in the cold, but it is turning into winter. So, hey, you know what? Air conditionings aren't coming on. I'm driving with the windows down. Life is grand because the next couple months is why we live in Phoenix, Arizona. You know, and I'm really looking forward to it. Right? And yeah, seriously, this is why we live in Arizona. You wake up, you're walking around. It's not cold. You're not shoveling snow out of your driveway or anything like that. Right? And some people even you know, still get to use their swimming pools, right? Because they, they have them heated and whatnot, right? So, which means we're always watching children and pets around water. Not everybody drains their pools in the wintertime. And unfortunately, there's always an opportunity for children to drown in these pools, in these unattended pools. So we're watching them. We are going to get more rain, so we're not drive, you know, driving into flooded areas, all right? And we're working our circles now more than ever, all right? Um, if you... Have a friend that you haven't talked to in a while? Reach out. Give them a call, right? Especially if they have anything to do or any families on either side of the wall over there in the Middle East right now. I'm sure they could use a call and know that you're thinking about them. While we're doing this, have a great day. Have a great weekend. And I'll talk to you guys next week. If I can turn this off because my mouse turned itself off. Serious. Great weekend. Go have one.